this session will be on explainability of ai algorithms which is a very fascinating topic for me at least and i'm sure it is for all clinicians in the group so for this i would like to invite professor parindra elavathi to coordinate the session professor elavathi is working as a professor in department of computational data sciences in iic bangalore this he works on medical image analysis and also image processing physiological signal processing and he is working in the area of ai and medical image analysis since a decade i believe so i invite professor alavarti and up to you so i hand over to you sir thank you very much i know that uh, this session is uh, holding you back from your lunch so but hopefully it will be worthwhile uh, so let me introduce uh, dev dut uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, dev dut is an assistant professor of electrical engineering as well as uh, center of excellence in ai uh, at iit kharagpur uh, he is also a founder of skin care curate research which is a startup based in uh, kharagpur uh, he was the conference organizer Okay, Devdoot, I have new instruction that you have to switch on your video and uh, then be present. Devdoot, are you there? Okay, so we need to allow him to turn on the video. uh they do uh, looks like they have given you the permission yeah now now it's done hello am i audible now yeah uh, you are audible they do <laughs> yeah. to see you there but again i'm going to restart again introducing you uh so they do is an assistant professor of electrical engineering as well as center of excellence in ai at iit kharagpur Uh, he is a founder of skin curate research uh, which is a startup based in karakpur and uh, more importantly just in the march of uh, this year uh, he was the conference organizing chair for isb uh, which is one of the largest conference in the biomedical imaging and uh, his uh, research interests include computational medical imaging machine learning ai and the social implications of technology of course the talk he is going to give is explainability of ai algorithms in healthcare up uh, to you dev dut thanks funny <clears throat> so it's a pleasure to be speaking over here and uh, i will try to do as much as justice as possible to this particular topic uh, which kondinya requested me to do and uh, uh, definitely i really look forward to this forum to even hearing more uh, in in terms of uh, what we are planning to go ahead uh, and where we can do it so this is a this is nice to see that uh, there's a meeting where we have clinicians and one of our dynamic clinical leaders leading this one and uh, sitting along with the ai community together so this is our uh, uh, particular use case from one of the meager uh, or, or the first stage of those explainabilities which we were trying to do and in fact the reason why we went on explainability was to see that whatever we are developing over here that it's pretty much verifiable that is what the need uh, was at that particular point in time so yeah so at the start of it uh, just a bit of disclosure i just run through this one uh, till it comes to an end yeah now the primary part uh, the first definition from where i always look into any kind of a problem which has learning involved into it or whatever we are trying to solve today is uh, to look it back into the definition of machine learning itself and this is uh, from tom michel's very classical definition over there so it, it very clearly says that a computer program is said to learn with experience e with respect to a certain class of task t and you need to be able to measure the performance with a performance measure p and in all of this uh, standard definition explainability trust verifiability they were never figured out so this this statement when it was first crafted it never had those so what it basically said was very simple is uh, you need a machine to do a task which is sort of repeatable and in order to understand how to do a task it is going to rely on its experience 
so it will look into uh, several uh, sets of examples of how others have done it so it may be other machines have done it or other humans have done it and then you are going to measure the performance of how this particular machine is doing up that task and there is a performance measure peak in nowhere over here uh, you see whether uh, you, you don't see a particular mention about can you verify how the machine is learning to do the task you don't see a mention of the fact that can uh, can the reasoning by which the machine is arriving at a decision be trusted by a human can we share the reasoning behind a decision by a machine with a human and these are points uh, because of which we today in the whole field of getting into looking into ai adoptions into medicine we see that there is a problem the problem is because i do not have a machine i do not have an interpretability within a machine's reasoning which i can share with a clinician and because i am not able to share it with a clinician so one clinician is not able to reason it out so if you look into how radiologist reports are written how reporters report radiology or pathology or uh, even uh, ophthalmology or, or any any of those uh, imaging based modalities or even non imaging based modalities they give a reason and this reason is pretty much deep rooted into biology it is pretty much deep rooted into the fundamental or the classical textbooks like understanding about disease processes but then machines today how we know cnns neural networks uh, uh, decision trees random forests svms they don't do it in that way and that's where that's where we uh, get stuck so standing on top of this particular definition if we look forward then the fundamental way of how decisions are made is essentially based on a statistically informed decision making and this has its root into the bayes rule what it says is very simple in a modified form which we are generally used to looking at it essentially gives us some sort of an estimate uh, or a probability of a certain uh, event to happen uh, given that i know about all the conditions associated with that decision to be taken so if omega is a decision which i make subject to i have an observation on x then what is the probability i will take a certain decision so this observation of x is what i see over here they may be a certain set of symptoms the omegas which i see over here they may be a certain set of uh, diseases and i'm just going to get down a particular probability this is what machine learning is supposed to do and the way it would do it is that it makes use of another set of probability which i have with me which is called as likelihood so the likelihood is essentially for a given uh, disease where it is confirmed that a subject has that particular disease we have a noting of all the symptoms which are present over there and we try to see which symptom comes in what frequency as a result of which i get some sort of a probability measure over there and that probability measure is what is called as likely i would also have access to a probability of what is the occurrence of a certain disease so what is the frequency with which it can occur what is a what what will be the relative distribution between a bit for a certain disease to occur between a set of multiple diseases over there and then the next part which i need to look into is evidence which is essentially nothing other than what is the probability that a certain symptom can occur itself so there may be some things like where we don't even know anything about the symptom as an example like when covid uh, happened the major problem was that we did not have we had not seen that kind of a disease so the symptoms for the early days on the first wave was really the most eluding part everybody was trying to look into everything in order to identify what is a symptom so the evidence was essentially zero that was uh, a major problem which was striking over there now standing on top of it let's look deeper into what happens because the reason i'm doing this part of it is all all reasoning and explainability essentially is very deep rooted into how we train classical machine learning algorithms and where we need to relook into the whole training uh, training philosophy in a way so if i take a toy example over here <clears throat> and this is about stand on any crossroad of a a uh, village or a tier 3 town in india I and mean, kharagpur had this one pretty even a few years ago these days i i don't see those anymore where you can see cows and cars all crossing uh, at the same crossroad but if you were doing that um, it's a pretty amusing thing to do you don't never get bored on a traffic jam uh, over there because you will have a lot of wildlife crossing you as well so if if 
if I was trying to do something like this, that I measure two different attributes about a certain object. And what I'm measuring one is the length of the object. The other attribute which I measure is the shade of color of that particular object. And then I try to make a decision whether that object is a cow or a car. I don't have images. I, I am just having just two simple scalar measurements which come down from two very simple sensors. Now cows and cars, they have almost the same kind of a length and they vary in any shades of color, whatever you can think about. And then we are looking at grayscale shades. So this is just uh, the lightness factor which we are looking into it. If I stand over there, say for an hour, I see all the cars, all the cows which pass by, I take these measurements and say, I will have an observation matrix. And if I plot it down over here onto this feature space, then this is what it looks like. So the icons are just notational and uh, they, they basically indicate where the data point lies on this data matrix over here. So what we would do is once you have this data, you get down your prior probability, you get your likelihood, you get your evidence. And essentially for any given point in space, you can solve out for your posterior probability. Now, once we get this posterior probability, we make a decision in favor of a certain class. So if I just have to make a decision whether at a certain measurement of X1 and X2, which is length and shade, uh, is the object which is present over there, a cow or a car. Then the way I do it is, uh, we make use of this very famous rule called as maximum a posteriori rule. And then uh, and on what it says is very straightforward that whichever class has the highest posterior probability is the one which is essentially present at that particular location. That's it. Nothing other than that. So now if I densely look at every single point of X, all possibilities of X, I scan through it. I solve this equation. I would see that there is a boundary which would come down. And this boundary is something like on one side of the boundary, all decisions will be in favor of one class. They might have a different posterior probability, but essentially one class will always have the highest posterior probability. On the other side of the boundary, the other class is going to have the highest posterior probability. And this is what comes out over here. So this boundary line is what we call as a decision boundary over here. Now, there are a certain set of challenges associated with decision boundaries, and that makes this problem all the more interesting. In one of those cases, which is pretty much ideal, we would have a lot of samples. This is the case of abundant samples present over here. So when I have abundant samples, I really don't worry about how good is my decision boundary because I will be able to do only one such kind of a decision boundary, which will uniquely fit through here. So in this case, this is basically a um, third order polynomial decision boundary, which we look into over here. In the case, if I don't have so many abundant samples, this may be one of the possibilities, but then I cannot even rule out this to be another possibility. And in fact, for most machine learning problem designers, when we try to design a model, which has less number of free parameters to be tuned, then this blue line or the second case is what is more preferred because it's a straight line. I just have two free parameters, two degrees of freedom to tune in order to get that one. The real challenge comes down in the actual real world case is when we are actually in the scar sample case. So we have so less samples, so less samples, it really becomes problematic. So on the first case, the straight line actually fits at good, but then this can be one possibility. This can be another possibility. This can be another possibility. And there can be tons of those possibilities which can arise over here. So what it means is that there are definitely multiple models which will give you the same performance. In fact, this is a case where you see that there are multiple models which are giving you a performance of 100% of classification. So in case of machine learning, now this is the next level of dilemma. In fact, I will show you in one of the cases where we actually got down, you took multiple CNN models, each with a different architecture, different training points, everything, all saturate at the same point. They give you the same performance, all have the same accuracy, same um, AUCs, whatever metric you take in over there. So the reason is, <clears throat> that we are basically with so scarce amount of data that we, whatever you try to do, you can have multiple models which can give an approximation and it's a good approximation on the validation side. There's no problem around with it. The challenge comes down when you try to put it into the field and that's where you can have a lot of erratic behaviors. And the bigger challenge for the clinician, why today AI will not be trusted to do a final sign off on a report is because you don't have a reasoning coming on it. In case there is a fallout, then how do you go back and question why was there a fallout is the bigger point. So in order to look back at that, <clears throat> let's try to understand why these challenges keep on happening over here. 
so if we look into this <coughs> decision uh, rule from the base part of it then the order of polynomial of this likelihood is something which guides the order of polynomial of this decision boundary itself so if the likelihood is a cubic function then uh, the polynomial is a cubic polynomial it can also be a quadratic one it can be a linear one anything based on that so <coughs> Essentially, the prior probability is something which is more of a constant or, or an estimator which is not drifting so fast. It's, it does not change along with x. The x part is not there. The only thing which is dependent on x is the likelihood. The denominator over here, which is the evidence, is also dependent on x. And then we also know that if you expand it out, it's basically uh, sum of the marginals on the numerator. And as a result of which, whatever is the order of likelihood is the same as the order of the evidence. And uh, both being of the same order, that is the same as order of... Uh, the polynomial which defines the posterior probability and hence also defines the decision boundary over here. So going from here, the main problem comes down is that there can be multiple solutions, multiple models. So different models with different orders of free variables and all of them are almost going to give you the same kind of a fit and same kind of a performance on the validation set itself. Now, when you come down to the real scarce data problem, which has, uh, and, and we take the easiest of the models, which is just two parameters, you would see that there can be multiple such solutions of this model. And this is what we typically call as multiple snapshots of the same model. So, so here, what I have is the same model, but different snapshots of the solution and different instances it comes from, and you would get down. So a lot of times when we train neural networks with lesser amount of data, we see that the error more or less remains the same over epochs, but you would see that the weights are changing within the neural network. And then a lot of times what we associate that is saying that because your momentum is so high that you are always missing the local minima over there. Yes, that, that's true in some factor. If the momentum was not that high, you would have missed. But in general, even you would still come down to some sort of an approximate behavior over there. And in general, I can say from whatever we have learned about training neural networks over these kind of data sets, they will never come to a convergence point. You can draw your, you can make your learning rates as low as possible, still it doesn't happen. But I mean, these are again things to work out. And the reason it doesn't happen is because everything is an approximate solution and you have hit the boundary uh, of whatever could be derived over there. So going on how all of this evolved, essentially the whole field started with uh, AI and, and where initially it was a rule-based system. So we are speaking about 80s. Now, beyond that, uh, designers in the whole field, they understood that you need to learn decisions and classical ML. So the base rule was one of those classical things. And today what we look into neural networks, generative models, graph-based neural networks, uh, attention models, uh, all of these are essentially, which are trying to learn these decisions right from the data and a set of annotated examples. And a lot of times they can go as low as a single snapshot learning as well. From there, we move forward. Uh, we discovered that we might also need to learn features and not just the decision. So discovering features was itself coming up. Uh, a wonderful example of this, which we have today is the JPEG compression because uh, image to image, it figures out which coefficients to actually store out over there in order to stabilize the quality to a certain level. And beyond that, today we look into deep learning, which is more of looking into not just learning the first level of features, but also deriving a lot of abstract features out from here. And today standing on this one in the era of deep learning is where this problem really gets complicated because all of those polynomial order complications and, and data insufficiency is what plagues each of these layers in a model, which, which can be replicated as, as one every layer in across the depth of a neural network, uh, which needs to be stabilized. And, and that's where we are in the problem as of today. <clears throat> now, in order to do that, any person who starts working in this field of machine learning, what they are going to do is, we would try to refract the problem into three cardinal aspects. One of them is to understand the data in a good way. So it's easiest to solve the problem when you really have a good distribution of the data. It's really tough to solve the problem when the data is really scarce over here. There can be multiple possibilities of a solution. There is no unique solution. The next is to understand the order of the model. So the easiest is always to solve a linear model. You have the lowest com complexity over there. The more higher order polynomials you go towards, the total complexity of solving a problem keeps on increasing. The next is to understand the control plane, which is essentially to look into how do you fit the, how do you mold the parameters of a certain model so that it fits itself 
to a data distribution and this uh, thing can be formed. So essentially, how do you tune your model to do that? And, that, and all of that is done through the control plane solution. Earlier days with, with uh, maximum likelihood estimation and today what we do is in terms of perception losses. Now, once you refract all of this problem, we start solving and, and try to see that we have a model, we have the data, and we also see that the model fits onto the data. Proof around this one was a paper which we had published in EMBC 2020. So this was essentially a systematic search over uh, deep CNNs and for the purpose of screening chest radiographs. Public data set standard experiment you can recreate on bulk. There are standard set of publications which happened around over this one. What we were trying to do is that, how do you really search over this space very systematically and also check uh, the reasoning with the radiologist in the loop? So let's get into the, the primary crux of it. So first and foremost, the point is that we trained multiple models. They included DenseNet, uh, ResNet, Exception, Inception, VGG, uh, and, and others over there. And we did find out that multiple models, say, say the DenseNet 121, the ResNet 18, and the Exception Network, they were performing equivocal. They were all, all at about 95% accuracy across multiple classes. We did show that for each of these pathological states over here on the chest radiograph, for every of these pathological states, what was the AUC curve coming down over there? If you see more or less, the AUC curves are almost the same. You can pretty much estimate that they have an area under the ROC curve, uh, which is... Um, sort of between uh, 0.88 to 0.92 uh, in, in a range, which is uh, pretty close by performing models over there. Now the challenge is that if these models were so close by performing, then do I take a dense net, uh, ResNet 18 or an exception? If you ask a computational guy, a computational engineer is going to say that whichever has the least computational overload, you are basically going to take that one. The question over here is that, did you ask a clinician on which of the models is trusted? And that's the experiment which we started. So what we wanted to do over here is that introduce another new aspect into it, which is, do I have some sort of a visual explainer available for these models, which a radiologist can trust? So now comes the point that can, can we get a radiologist in the loop? Can we do a validation with visual explainers over there? So the task was pretty straightforward. You have a data set, you have several sets of CNN models, they are all trained. Great. You take each of them and how they are trained is something like this. You take an architecture, uh, you have all the weights and everything which is randomly initialized, you train it from scratch. You take another, in another case, what you do is you take an off-shelf architecture and, and you don't modify the weights of the CNN, but you just make or modify the weights of the uh, final layer over there, the decision layer. You take another one where you are doing a fine tuning all through the architecture of the CNN over there. And this is the pre-trained network. Now you have multiple of these candidate networks which come down and across architectures and training rules, whatever you have defined, you would find out that there would be a few of these models which would show very good accuracies. You pick them up. Now, once you pick them up, you show these models to a radiologist in terms of their performance. But the point is that your CNN is just going to give you a probability of it seeing a certain class of pathology, whether there was cardiomegaly, whether there was uh, uh, consolidation or not. It's, it may give you a probability, but the model does not directly give you a location where it looked into and came to this decision. Did it do a differential comparison? Did it look in comparison in order to do? Uh, directly looking into a CNN model, you never get it. But there are tools which came off in the recent years. One of them is uh, called as RISE. This is from one of my colleagues in computer science over here. Uh, he had a publication in BMBC 2018. Uh, and it's, it's widely regarded as a very effective way for black box testing of models. So what you do is you don't need, you don't need grad cams, et cetera, et cetera, over there where you need to probe into your model. So your deep neural network can actually be a black box. I, you, I don't need access to your IP internal to your deep neural network. What I can get is I can get an activation map or some sort of a sensitivity or susceptibility map, whatever you call it. It's essentially an importance map associated with every single pixel on an image, which is going to tell me that for a certain decision to be taken, if it is saying that this is consolidation, then it will tell me where did it look like, where did it assign the highest importance and which, which of the pixels did play the highest importance 
in signifying that this was consolidation. So this gives me a very good understanding because now I have a visual explainer. Once I run an image through this black box and this testing method on that image, if I need to look into a certain decision, which was made now, I can see like, where did the model actually look into which of those pixels played the highest uh, significance in deriving this uh, decision over here. Looking onto that, this is what we tried now. So what we did is we took a bunch of validation radiographs available with us. The same radiograph was pushed through all the models, which we have. So all the trained candidate models, which have People on the Zoom, I think we lost their group. Uh, so the radiologist who had marked this location over here. On the other series of things which you see over here, you are able to see uh, these decisions and the reasons which are coming up over here. So that's that's critical. Now what you do is you are you are looking into each of them and doing it. What we found out, uh, if you look at the last row, which looks into cardiomegaly, you would see that most of the models look at very weird places. They don't even look in the right one. Densenet, which had a better performance, is worse than Inception because Inception is the one which is actually giving you the right decision coming over here. You had it for VG, for VG19, all of these. Uh, Exception, which was doing good on the numbers, actually had a wrong decision. It was looking everywhere. So that, that's what makes it interesting. So that's where I would come to an end for what I wanted to speak. And then we can discuss further on this one. So if you want to learn more uh, about it, then these are just two snapshots about our group page uh, where we have more of these exciting research and some of the courses which we run from our group uh, over and over on NPTEL in order to brief the community about how to use these tools and techniques and, and uh, the general learning uh, around it. So with that, I really would like to conclude my talk and really thank the organizers for uh, giving us this chance. It's a bit of small goodbye from our group as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dattu. Uh, we will take a few questions. Hi, I am Sobhya from uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I am a assistant professor in gastroenterology. So we use uh, CNN networks uh, for during our endoscopy to differentiate between cancerous and precancerous regions who have our endoscopy suit, which has inbuilt AI software uh, for this, which is in developmental phase. But sometimes it uh, has very high false positivity rate in those uh, uh, areas where, which are not the region, but that deliberately shown by the software. Uh, so, uh, so, we, uh, so is there any way uh, we can uh, uh, care of that with the, can we change the, Good uh, model for that, or uh, sometimes the model performs very well, but uh, when you perform in, uh, when you use it in real time, it shows very high false positive rate. So, how do you take care of that? So, see, essentially, the point that it shows you high false positivity rates is that all of these models they get validated on an internal set. It typically the internal set has a distribution in the data which is the same as whatever was there in the training set. So, it worked out good. It's certified, it's out over there. There is the data drift which happens when you put it into use over here. One of the ways of testing it out is definitely with this kind of visual explainers. This is where we, like people who certify AI algorithms will now have to think onto it. For your case, the solution may not be an immediate one, but definitely like you will have to change. So you cannot trust your AI algorithm. It is, uh, it's, it's something like uh, somebody told me that uh, how, uh, these uh, say uh, local pharmacies, how they give out medicine. So if it is monsoon and anybody people, and, and you know that there is a prevalence of malaria, then anybody who goes with fever and uh, and they are shivering twice uh, in the day.
written on your site. These need certification. We need validations in a much more effective way beyond just looking into accuracy because the measure which you used to train the model cannot be the measure which you use to verify whether the model is really stable or not and trustable for long-term use. Thank you. Yes, sir. First of all, I would like to thank you. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm Alok. I'm a PhD scholar, second year at IIIT Delhi in the field of uh, bioinformatics and computational biology. And uh, I keep on working on all these techniques. So, a very basic question, not a technical one, but a general question. Sir, how do you see the future of uh, all these AI in healthcare after 25 years, 30 years from now? Like, do these fields have a potential? to give a long-term recognition to a scientist. Like basic science, because what I feel nowadays is that uh, all the students from the basic science background also are trying to make a transition to the field of AI and ML. So, um, and even without learning the mathematics and the statistics behind these concepts. So how do you uh, see the future of these things uh, for a student from the basic biomedical sciences? Thanks. Uh Question. Yeah, so so this may be a risk to take it as a toolbox and use it. If you want to really contribute, please get back to understanding the fundamental math behind how it's done. Otherwise, it's really risky to do. On terms of like in the next 25 years, how it will be, I, I believe that AI would essentially turn out to be a commodity. It will be a usable commodity. It will become that conveniently usable as whatever you are doing today with say, hello Google or uh, uh, hello Alexa or, or it, hi Siri, these kind of stuff. So you already see that over there for consumer grade usage for lifestyle applications. Medicine will also have it. I mean, I, I know there are wonderful people around over there in the audience. A lot of their names and, and I see on this Zoom meeting as well. They use it in and out. I mean, radiology is one of those specialties which uses AI as a commodity usable thing. The only question which comes down is the previous speaker, whatever he was asking. Uh, I mean, the previous uh, question which you had was essentially on like, it, it gives me a lot of false positives and everything. And we are working. I think now is that point where we are asking those critical questions. We know the computation, we know how to train it. We can make great products. Now we are asking those questions that are these products trustable? Are they reasoning properly? And do we have a justification behind the way they reason? So once we do keep on doing this, it will become much more community friendly and, and much more a usable commodity. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I'm Dr. Yeshti, I'm an endocrinologist, uh, hardcore clinician. So uh, basically, since morning, we are like uh, more focused on a mage based AI. Initially, we had lectures on ultrasound based, and then you showed some examples on the chest radiography. So from a clinician point of view, I think it's more important like from treatment decisions. For example, we uh, built a decision support, uh, clinical decision support system for a primary care physicians. A very simple rule based. Uh, thing uh, to bring it to the primary health care. So, uh, like, is there, is there like a bit of more concern in building AI in uh, for treatment algorithms as compared to the image analysis? This is my first question. Oh, there is. There is, there is a lot of effort. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, time that what I had to speak and prioritize today. There are works which we do in our group, which looks into, in fact, like, we, we were the one who developed the first COVID-19 reporting radiology standard sheet. So Dr. Anjali Agarwal, I see her on the Zoom meeting. She's there. She's aware of this one because the moment we started doing something and we're there, I, I sent her an email with the link and everything and asked her like, can you open and give us how it looks like? So the, it was a data-driven discovery process. So on a need basis, we are, we are working across the length and breadth of wherever automation and AI has to be bring in in order to make humans much more uh, competent and much utilize that time in a much more better and fruitful way. So any repetitive process is, is what is getting automated with an AI route. Second, second part of my question is like, for example, uh, for diabetes, for example, we have like six classes of oral drugs, right? So the oral drugs we prescribe based on post, based on like hypoglycemia potential weight gain, since like post is a dynamic factor, which, which post like, uh, 
uh, on a higher end today may become at a lower end. So the prescription pattern changes. Similarly, like a new drug comes in six months, 12 months. So we have six, we have seven, the hierarchy of prescribing will change. For example, now you build a like AI based some sort of guidance based on existing drugs, existing pattern. And suddenly six months later, the hierarchy changes with the introduction of new drugs, even the older drugs hierarchy changes. So what's the flexibility of this sort of uh, uh, AI systems in the clinical practice with, uh, with the changing? So that's where we are looking into lifelong learning and collaborative learning, more and more AI systems. So to give you an example, I mean, you, you, uh, I mean, if you use this uh, Google Assistant on your Android smartphones or uh, Siri on your Apple uh, uh, iPhones and, and uh, Alexa on the Amazon Echo, uh, all of these different ones over there, you would see that uh, the more you keep on speaking with them, the more and more better they become in understanding what your commands are, what you are exactly asking. So it's, it's learning, it's, it's improving itself. So if it does something wrong, you correct it. And so it learns it up. So in fact, like in the whole field of medicine, it's, it's happening. So all of these, um, an example is, uh, IBM's Watson. So Watson actually improve, improves every time it, it gets a feedback. So if it's a positive negative, each feedback, it keeps on updating itself. So there are temporal drifts and then because it keeps on updating itself. So it observes the global drift on a global level, it also tunes itself to the local drifts. And that's how uh, it adapts itself to changing uh, statistical nature of the data. And then accordingly can adapt with time or what you are asking for. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think now your time. I guess this uh, computer is working here and data data. You are, we are talking about experimentality of modern drugs. And the features, as you showed us, so we can keep map or we can find it in region in the area which is most attractive. And for numeric data, we can identify variable importance and position by variable importance. So there are several other algorithms which we are using. But what I want to ask you is at what point of time? Okay, so so the, there was some disturbance in in that audio line, but what I understood is that if I am a developer, then in which which time on my life cycle, on my development life cycle, do I first introduce these kind of verifications coming in? So in the in the exploratory phases, definitely not. Where this has to be is that if I set a certain target level that my models need to achieve this kind of a performance based on whatever performance measure. So AUCs, F scores, uh, accuracies or something. Once I have a set of candidate models, which have come to that level, then I start doing this verification. The, the only reason why I would do the verification at that point is because I need to get a radiologist, a human being. A human being's time is much more costly. Computers are, you can do it over and over again. So if we can automate certain of these processes, we are actually working in our group, but I still don't have tangible results to show in front of a community. But we are trying to see that how much can we minimize uh, humans' uh, involvement in this whole in the loop verification going down over there. And while we keep on doing this, I, I strongly believe that somewhere down the line, in the future, maybe five years down the line, we will be having this verification as one more access. And maybe that's when we can go back and, and retune uh, this, this uh, Tom Mitchell's definition of learning, where we also put down another definition, another extra keyword over there saying that, and you are able to verify. So till then, it will be at a discrete step that you, you reach your numerical accuracies and then only you start doing the verification. Uh, but once we are there that we have a in-loop verification, which can be automated on a computer, we would definitely have that as an access. So I think we'll take one online question. Is there any online question? Um, hi, uh, hi. Uh, this is Anjali speaking. Uh, yeah. I'm a radiologist. Uh, Devitu, that was an ex excellent talk, and I really enjoyed the discussions. Um, I just had one question, and uh, you know, from what I had heard recently, that uh, the self-learning algorithms are 
not uh, acceptable or legally acceptable uh, in terms of clinical usage. So the algorithms, basically the changes are, the feedback is provided, but they cannot self-learn and it has to be a sort of a timed revision of the AI tool. Is that true or, or, or have I missed out something? No, you are, you are perfectly true. So in fact, the whole community of reinforcement learning tries to do that one. Uh, yes, so what we need to do, go over here where it misses is that the first principle definition of Tom Mitchell is obeyed. Yes, it is good on the performance. Everything is being met from numerical perspective. The point is, is the model thinking in the same way as a human being or is the model able to convey its thought process to a human being who can trust it? So the question why these uh, AI, these kind of self-learning AI models in medicine are not accepted is because they are not able to convey their reason back to me. And take an example, I mean, when you train your next generation of uh, interns and younger residents, you would always quiz them and ask that, what is the reason behind your decision? Mm -hmm. A model to you is, is the same kind of a uh, tutor. If you go and ask another colleague, you might also ask the same thing for a cross observation. What is the reason for your reporting? That, that your colleague needs to give the reason. Without that, how will you really go back and trust? So that's the basic of clinical sciences that we have a reasoning which we trust based on our knowledge accrued over these many years. We don't get that from these models. Why should I trust the model? Uh, if, if there is time, uh, may I be allowed another question? Uh, sure, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Devitu, uh, also, you know, like you briefly alluded to the fact that, you know, you're, you, uh, you're trying to minimize the human intervention because, you know, time is very precious for doctors are all very busy. So uh, is that the trend or is that what we are looking at that going forward, the annotations, perhaps, you know, I'm talking about the image-based AI tool development would perhaps become automated. It's only the uh, sort of the validation part and the, uh, the real workflow incorporation feedback. That is where you would need the doctors, the radiologists. Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, let's, let's have the radiologist to do really that super part of it where you need the human brain to work. Whatever is iterative can be done easily on a computer. Let it be off offloaded to a computer. Thank you. Very nice, thank you. Thanks, Devdu. Uh, you have brought us back uh, with the time. Uh, unfortunately, we have to break for lunch. I think everybody is hungry. So thank you very much. Uh, let's give a round of applause for the Devdu. Thank you.